I said to Carol, how shall I introduce you? As venerable, indefatigable, she said, at decrepit, inability to say no. Um, I came across Carol's work as a dissertation supervisor for the ESO and was asked to adjudicate on her dissertation. I really liked what she had to say. I really felt in terms of a research conference, this needed to be presented and aired to make it <coughs> how we go about research. Carol, again, tried to say no, but didn't manage it. So, hence the reason she's here today. And uh, thank you, Carol, for coming. Thank you. Right, I've got the, I brought a sh short straw, I think. <laughs> Probably being a bit sleepy. I am going to talk about the placebo effect. But I'm going to start with where my journey started, because I think Clive invited us to do that. And this is all about journeys. So if I go back one. Where my journey started, my interest in science, um, probably about the age of 16, in Australia, they ran a science talent contest for keen, keen would-be scientists. And um, I went in two years running, 1959 and 1960. And my first one was to look at microscopic organisms. Now, that doesn't seem very spectacular. That is times 400. But if you think that was done with a box brownie camera, that with, and with a toy microscope that didn't have a condenser, didn't have a lighting system. And when I look back, because I, in my profile I wrote that I started with this science talent contest <laughs> as a teenager. And then I went around the loft to actually find it. And I don't think I've looked at it since I was a teenager. And what I discovered was the data I collected at that time would mean I could reproduce the experiments now. Things like the time exposure. Because it was a brown box camera on a child's microscope, you couldn't just click the shutter, you had to hold it open for certain lengths of time. And I recorded all the different lengths of time I'd done and what type of pictures I got. So I'll just flip through these very quickly. I'm, I am going to move on to placebo. But that's a cyclops. I obviously decided it was a female. I can't remember why now, but that's a female. <laughs> time 75 and four second exposure. And here we have Cypress Cusca, and there are various types, and this is one of the larger ones. I have submitted that project together with a friend, Elba, I need to give her credit to, and we got a bursary. The next year, we decided to be a little bit more adventurous, and we thought we'd make heavy water. And heavy water is D2O, and D2 is an isotope, D is an isotope of hydrogen. So we thought we could make heavy water and test its effect on microorganisms. And I'm actually surprised at how ambitious we were. It was not possible for us to make this in a school laboratory. It started with a fractionating column. We decided we'd do fractional distillation. That fractionating column has a story to it. I went into Melbourne to buy this. We saved our pocket money. Went into Melbourne to buy this fractionating column. Queued with all the other budding scientists for about an hour to get it. Came out with my fractionating column, saw a tram, rushed for the tram and smashed it on a lamppost. Oh. Burst into tears, ignored the queue, rushed to the front of the queue and said, I've smashed my fractionating column. And he said, I think it must have been forty dear. Let's find you another. And he <laughs> <laughs> So that's a, a quick anecdote. Fractionating column was too small, we made a longer one, we filled this glass tube with stones and we needed more water, so we ended up with this petrol can. So we went on, we tried isotopic exchange. We were weighing the water, <laughs> never changed. Um, then we tried electrolysis, none of which worked. So we weren't able to go on to test the water on microscopic organisms. But um, we were keen, 
And I think that keenness has never left me. And that was the beginning of my journey. I then went from there into research. I worked in cancer research and tissue culture. Had some good results, actually. From there, I became a biomedical scientist and I worked in hospital laboratories. Routine. Changed course, took a psychology degree and a diploma in special education on needs and help with children with learning difficulty. Finally met an osteopathic fixed my back, almost fixed my back, <laughs> and um, went into osteopathy, which I really love. And now I'm slipping back into research again. So I feel as if I've come full circle. I'm doing my doctorate with the British School of Osteopathy, and hopefully I'll come up with some interesting, exciting project like this one. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm going to look at the placebo effect. What I want to do is um, think about placebo, the importance for us as osteopaths, because very often what we do is decried, and people say it's just the placebo effect, that we're not doing anything at all. And I think we have to find evidence to show that some of the things we do, a lot of what we do is placebo effect, but some of the things we do maybe does make change, and I think we need the research to be able to decide that. So I'm going to think about it in relation to the importance to osteopaths. Past research, so what has been done in the past, my own research, which was a literature review, um, a critical literature review, it wasn't a systematic one. Current understanding, so sort of where we are now and the way forward from there. Some of these I may read. These are definitions, so I'm actually going to read them. Um, a placebo is a substance or a procedure that is administered with suggestion, that's the important word there, that it will modify a symptom or sensation, <coughs> but which, unknown to the recipient, has no specific pharmacological impact on the reaction in question. Um, and Spiro suggests that any interaction with a patient, whether it be an osteopathic one or the doctor-patient relationship is they're all capable of producing the placebo effect. Another definition, I like this one, the physician's belief in the treatment and the patient's faith in the physician, so we've got a mutual thing there, exert a mutually reinforcing effect. The result is a powerful remedy that is almost guaranteed to produce an improvement and sometimes a cure. And the final, more scientific one, this sounds a bit like an enzyme. A placebo is a substance or procedure that has no inherent power to produce an effect that is sought or expected. So creating the placebo effect is something that we're all very good at. Um, but it's not just the complementary therapists that are good at it. Any visit to a doctor, any procedures that are a bit complicated have the power to produce placebo effect in the patient. It's not something you give them, it's, some, it's a response in the patient to what is being administered. That's sometimes the conversation, the rapport that you have with the practitioner, what the practitioner does. Um, possibly we have a better chance at harnessing the placebo effect than because we have time with our patients, we have time to establish rapport and maybe that gives us a better opportunity to optimise the treatments we give. The original study was done by Beecher in 1955, and he alleged that 35% of patients treated with placebo responded. Now, his studies have been discredited um, because he made no account for natural course of the disease, and his statistical analyses were poor. I think it's a shame that he's been discredited because he started us on the road. So he was the one that made us start thinking about effects that are not intended. <coughs> Mel and Wall found that two capsules are better than one, that a large capsule is better than a small, and injections are more um, effective than oral administration. You probably know all this, so I'll try and whip through it quite quickly. Um, red, red capsules are better at pain relief than blue, green or yellow, and blue pills make better sedatives than pink. <laughs> I think this, this has been shown quite. <laughs> so if we look at some of the experiments, 2001, and this was in the clinical setting, Amanzio looked at the effect of an analgesic 
medication, <coughs> Ketolac. It was administered in hidden infusion and openly. And the result is that the hidden infusion was found to be significantly less effective than when administered openly. So having picked up on this, he decided to try it in the experimental situation. So he introduced ischemic arm pain in his healthy volunteers, repeated the experiment using the Caterolac, and the result was the same. The hidden infusions were less effective than those administered openly. He went a bit further with this because they were beginning to think that what caused the placebo effect and that it might be opioids, natural opioids produced in the brain as a result of expectation of pain relief. So he did it again, but he administered naloxone, which is an anti-opioid substance. And so he repeated the experiment, having given the patients naloxone, and at the end of it, there was no difference between the placebo and the, um, the, the patients that had analgesia. Wow. And there's a little graph to show that. So the first one is no naloxone, and you see that the placebo, oh, my, my brain's gone blank. Yeah, the open and hidden infusion. So there was better pain relief with the open than with the hidden. And when they're given the naloxone, which is anti-opioid, there is no difference. So they're beginning to think that there is it's a much more complicated story actually than just opioid production by the brain. But there is a beginning of looking at what causes the placebo effect. Um, this experiment by Benedetti to try and look at the endogenous opioid system, he put cap, cap, cap casein on a patient's fingers and toes. And then he put an analgesic cream. Analgesic, it was actually a placebo. He was told the patient was analgesia um, on the, the foot, one of the feet. And the patient experienced pain relief only on that foot. So it's odd to say that like, opioid release is a systemic response. And yet, if there was a systemic response, why were there only relief on the one foot? Um, but then Benedetti decided from this experiment that there was opioid release. And other experimenters will come to them, look at that more closely, why should only one limb be affected? Um, I don't know how you pronounce that word, I've never discovered how you pronounce it. Halter, Haltia, Halsha, I'm not sure, showed that the expectation of intravenous glucose after an overnight fast triggered dopamine release. <coughs> so this is now not looking for pain relief, but for looking for relief from a fast. <coughs> they also showed there was a gender difference, men showing greater dopamine release than women. And there's a few occasions through this talk that you'll see that there is a gender difference. In the study of coronary heart disease, um, apply, um, compliance was linked to survival rate. So 80% of adherence to medication instruction showed better survival rates, whether they were on the drug or the placebo arm. So again, it's to do with what the patient is expecting, what the patient is thinking may come from it. And if they think there's going to be a positive reaction to a medication and they comply, they're likely to get it, whether it's a drug or a placebo. Now, this is um, Montgomery and Kirsch looked again. They did a similar experiment to Benedetti. Um, they applied, in fact, I've got to various parts of the body there. They gave electrical shock to the fingers. And one side had a placebo cream, and the other side didn't. And the one with the placebo cream experienced less pain than the one that had nothing. But it was a placebo cream. So they're saying that there was an endogenous opioid release. But if it is um, a global response, how come it didn't affect the other hand? So there's the beginning of thought that something else is going on. It's not pure opioid release that's causing the placebo response. There is something else. Emotion can be communicated through touch. You probably all have read Bevis Snaven's book. I've got something about it here, I think. Uh, I'll find it now. Of his book, Touch and Emotion in Manual Therapy, I imagine 
a lot of you have read it. The um, thing about his book, it's not that well referenced. So although I enjoy reading it, um, it's not terribly well referenced. And there is work of Langevin and Robert Schleip. Um, when an osteopath manipulates or applies mechanical force to tissue, the force is carried, and I think Bruno referred to this, by a mechanotransduction <coughs> by the ECM to the heart of the cell. So touch, be it technique or sham, will have a profound influence on the body. Okay, we're not alone in our inability to, um, to show that our techniques may be no better than sham techniques. Um, a lot of the experiments that have been done with medication, there is no better response to the medication than to the placebo pill. So Irving Kirsch believes that the effect is as Prozac may be attributed almost entirely to the placebo effect. And he did 19 analysis of 19 clinical trials and concluded that expectation of improvement, not alteration in brain chemistry, accounted for 75% of the drug's efficacy. This is another experiment, um, 2003. If you get the download of these, this, this slide and this slide, oh, I've only got permission to distribute it to 60 people. So, um, so 61 is there. Oh dear, I'll, I'll have to write again. But what I'm saying is those two slides, if you want to use any of this presentation, you need to get your own permission to use this one and the one that follows. Um, this was introduction of pain in the rectum by ins um, inserting air into the rectum. So they produced pain and on this one, the green, the green one, they didn't do anything at all. The green one, they didn't do anything at all. The purple, the placebo, and then Lida came. So the, the, the medication, the analgesic medication, is most effective there. But in the second experiment, they suggested to the patient that the placebo is going to give them pain relief. And with suggestion, so there's no suggestion at all of pain relief on that one, but with suggestion, the placebo does better than the lidocaine. So if you look at what's happening in the brain, and this is why it's such an expensive area to um, investigate, because it really does, a lot of the work now depends on doing MRI scans. But if you look at the areas of the brain that light up with pain, we've got S2, which is the bridge between the spinothalamic tract and the insula. S2, and then we've got the insula lit up here when the patient's experiencing pain. When you give them a placebo, those areas quieten down. So something is happening in the brain. And this area, the insula, ties in with um, the production of opioids, natural opioids <coughs> like dimorphine. That's just to show you where they are, S1, S2 there, um, on the post-central gyrus. I think I've virtually said that. Yes, I said it. Okay, that's the... Uh, can you read that from the back? Yeah. So, maybe we should invest in placebos. That's all I want to say about what has been done so far. And now we'll look at what I did and what I found out in my literature review. So this is my title. A placebo shall controls for manual therapies design difficulties. Um, I chose manual therapies, not just osteopathy, because if you try to find papers for just osteopathy, you wouldn't find very many. And if you added chiropractic to it, although they've done more than us, you still wouldn't find very many. So I had to broaden it and look at the manual therapies in general. And why I chose the topic? There's a drive to legitimise osteopathy. Um, the pro profession is challenged to produce proof, and we get a lot of bad press from Edzard Ernst. And I've got a little something about him here, if I can find it. Yeah. He, he, there's a blog, 
April 2013. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the Cochrane Review said the quality of evidence um, that there was a difference between sham technique and OMT for low back pain was low. And as a result of that, we got Ed Zardern's blog. Um, but he is very critical of what we do. And I think it's very important that we do research what we are doing and try and, as I say, legitimize it. Um, the gold standard is considered to be the double-blind, randomized controlled trial. But in fact, maybe this is not the best way for us to go forward with our osteopathy because of the problem with placebo. Or placebo in the sham technique. Um, Licky Ardoni said, the fledgling basic osteopathic research efforts of the mid-20th century have not been maintained over time. So a common experimental design is to compare an experimental technique, say an osteopathic technique, with a sham technique, both of which involve touching and interaction with the subject. The hypothesis being that if either is to have an effect, it will be the experimental technique, not the sham. And of course, in, in effect, that is not the case. Um, the fallacy is to assume that the placebo control will have no effect. But they have been shown to have a very powerful effect. So devising a placebo control for experiments in the manual therapies is an overriding problem. And so I decided to investigate how others have handled the problem and collate the available literature in the hope of forming some sort of useful resource. Um, now, Ernst and Harkness, I'll give him credit here when it's due. Um, he found few sham control double blind studies, and for those that existed, he felt they were serious methodological shortcomings. And that really is what I have found as well. After hours of perusing the literature, I had to agree with Ernst and Harkness. <laughs> so, hence, given that um, placebos have an effect, that it poses a problem for experimental design, I decided to do a critical literature review. So, the start of the long journey. Before I start that journey, my experience in research has always been the um, randomized controlled trial. I've never done a literature review before. I've never thought it as real science. I've never thought of it as real research. I was wrong. I have actually found that this is research and it's quite acceptable. Although I think you need pure research as well alongside it this is useful. So the start of my long journey, easy, I thought, just a book or a paper or something like that, or two, or three, or four. Um, the method I used was the updated method guidelines for systematic reviews in the Cochrane Back Review. And I followed that as far as possible. So it gives specific guidance for searching and outlines um, the important inclusion criteria to optimize the identification of as many relevant trials as possible. So the inclusion criteria ensure the stringency of the trials um, in terms of study design, participants, interventions, outcomes. And I thought, I don't know why, but I thought because of the difficulties with devising sham controls, what I would find was likely to be flawed. And maybe that's my bias, and maybe I shouldn't have been biased in that way. But I wasn't sure that I could <coughs> apply the stringent criteria that would be necessary. And by applying Boolean logic, keywords were used to access the internet literature. <coughs> uh, is everyone happy with the term Boolean logic? No. No. Oh. Oh. Um, I'll, do, I'll just give a simple demonstration. 
if you consider three circles, what you're looking for is information that falls in here, which might have, if someone was looking for psychological effect, touch, placebo. So I wanted that, and that, and that, in any of the uh, papers I was looking for. That would give me this area here, that's Boolean logic. Okay, if I wanted that and that or that, hang on, that and that or, oh, I'm not sure when that comes. <laughs> but if I wanted that or that, it comes in this area here. So it's when you're pu putting the things into the computer, asking for papers, you put and, and, or, you put or, or that and that, not that. It just narrows the search field and makes it easier to find what you're really looking for. Um, so these were um, some of the words that I would have in these circles to try and find the papers I wanted. Um, I, I don't know if you can see be below that, so if I read them out, uh, placebo, sham, experimental control, randomized control trial, touch, psychological, ECM, manual therapies, osteopathy, chiropractic. Um, the databases, again I follow the recommendations of the Cochrane guidelines. I'm just looking at the time. I'm going to be all right, aren't I? Because there's no practical. Um, they say, the Cochrane guidelines suggest, as an absolute minimum, you use Medline and Embase. Because they say searching Medline alone will not identify all the trials. Now, I found that to be wrong. There was an enormous overlap between Medline and Embase. And I didn't really... I discovered, learn more from using them both. Um, but maybe there's safety in using the two of them. Uh, databases I used were those held by Athens, CANLIS, the Complementary and Alternative Medicine Society, and the Royal Society of Medicine. Now, I, um, Casper said he didn't find the Royal Society of Medicine very useful. I found it my best source. I found them really helpful. I found this it's easy to go in, easy to find papers. But they have recently changed it. Um, and I think it's more difficult since they've changed it. I don't know if anyone's yes. possible. It's, it's now it's impossible, possible, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It, you, did you find it used to be good? It used to be brilliant. Yeah. And now it's not easy. And now no, you, a lot just, of the papers you can't get. And, and it's, yeah, they've, they've reduced it. It's so much more difficult to search. Yeah. And terribly difficult, very confusing. Yeah. So this is a bit out of date. Because that was my experience at the time of doing this project, but it's changed. And I joined the RSN just so that I could use their databases. And now I'm not sure that it's worthwhile being a member. Maybe it's to keep us fringe people out. <laughs> okay, so these were the da databases I looked at. Medline, Enbase, Ahmed, Sinal, PsychoInfo, and the Cochrane Library. Um, has it been done before? Mercado in 2008 did 126 trials using 25 different placebo interventions. So that was his literature review, but only five of the trials included any type of manual intervention. So for, it really hasn't been done before considering manual in intervention. Um, I looked at osteopathic and manual therapy research from 1993 to 2010. 2010 was when I had to submit. Um, and I chose 1993 as a starting point because that's when the general so I had to find a starting point somewhere. And that's when the General Osteopathic Council was set up and we had a regulator <coughs> encouraging us to do evidence-based research. Um, this literature review, I've already said, is not limited to osteopathy alone. I've included other medical therapies. Um, the background information, definitions and explanations of placebos and effect, that's included in my dissertation. Touch at both the psychological level and physiological. Difficult to find. I didn't find a lot of information on that, and I'm sure there's an opening for people to explore that further. Um, research highlighting the effects of patient expectation. Quite a lot out there on that. 
So I had two themes. One was to look at where the randomized controlled trial, where the design of the placebo sham technique was what they were investigating. So I looked at the two sorts of trials. One where they're investigating the sham technique alone. Is it suitable? Do, um, is the patient aware they're having a placebo or not? That sort of thing. And the other one was randomized control trials where they've used a sham control. So I was looking at those two things in the literature. I think most of that's been said. Yes, um, nearly all evidence-based medicine derives from principle and practices based on placebo. So that is not just us, but all evidence-based medicine. But medical researchers and physicians, on the other hand, have tended to ignore, minimize, and deride placebos and placebo effects. These sort of things need to be considered if you're running the placebo control. So the true treatment effect is the perceived treatment effect minus all of these things. The true placebo effect, the natural course of the disease, the regression towards the mean, time effects, and unidentified parallel <coughs> interventions. So your, this is your true treatment effect and all this has to be subtracted. Now that earns devised. So we might give him credit for that, but it was done by Grunborn in 1981, and Ernst did that in 1995. <laughs> it was done by him, and he gave him no credit at all for his work. Um, <laughs> Grunborn, um, I've actually quoted Ernst because it is a slight simplification, it's a bit easier. But this is the guy that did the work. And, um, however, I've got Ernst draws the need for an untreated control in addition to a placebo control. So what Ernst is saying is that you need um, your experimental patient, you need a sham technique, and then you need another one. Because an untreated patient, or sometimes they call it a walking patient, <laughs> who presents and you take the history but you do nothing, and you look at them at the end of the line, then you can see what the placebo effect has been, which you can then subtract your sham. So if you look there, this is the additive model. Both, so if this is the treatment or drug or whatever you want to call it, I thought I could use this thing, can't I? Sorry. Um, if the, the actual effect of your technique or your drug is going to be on top of the placebo technique. And one hopes that the placebo technique is the same in both. Not necessarily so. But that's what one might be looking for. So those are the sort of things. If you're going to have a placebo control, they're the sort of things that need to be considered. Um, I think I've just said that. The two arms of the study may not be equal. Um, patients, this is quite an important thing with placebo controls, adequate blinding of the patient. Okay, a case has been argued for the fact that whether through expectation, touch, endogenous dopamine release, placebos affect change. <coughs> so to what extent has this been investigated in relation to randomized control trials? That's where I got to with my, my thesis. I'll talk to you through some of the researches that I found. Um, Fulda attempted to address the problem and is concerned with the factors that need to be considered when selecting the optimum control. I'm going a bit blank, so I'm going to have to check my notes. Yes, he did 
he looked at um, light touch and HVTs. Um, oh, no, I still can't remember. Sorry. No, 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 no. I just can't remember. My mind's just gone blank. This is what happens. This is what happens when you carry on working and you get to my age. <laughs> <laughs> you get senior moments. Okay, that was it. He did HVTs, light touch, and ultrasound. And um, he showed the pair, the patients <coughs> a video of those, those procedures taking place. And at the end of it, the patients were given, or subjects, were given a questionnaire. And they had to decide which they thought would be the most effective treatment. So they filled out a questionnaire. They looked at HVT, like touch and ultrasound. And HVT and ultrasound came up top. They thought they would be the best treatments. Like touch, they didn't think, would be a good treatment. So they were then, from that, deducing that light touch might be a, would have less placebo effect than maybe the other techniques, and they would consider using that um, um, as a placebo or sham control. Um, now, Hawke and Long, they tried to look um, for what would make a suitable sham control, and um, they were looking at blinding. So this is one of their experiments. They set up, it's actually quite muddlesome, this, and maybe hard for you just now to quickly work it through, because I have to think through this every time I do it. But they set up these, these techniques with the idea that some of them would cancel each other out. And they used the pain disabilities index, and another one that didn't work, and asked patients to score these, um, how they thought they would be effective. And B was the one, the sham adjustment and effleurage was the one the patients thought would be least effective. So they decided, they, they um, asked them to score at three and six weeks, and they decided that B, therefore, might make a good sham control. So this is the beginning of people actually, they're not doing radio, radio randomized controlled assays. They're doing, they're actually looking, doing experiments to find out what would make a suitable control. So here's where they've set up an experiment. They've decided that the sham adjustment and effleurage is their control, and they've set it against an active treatment, and then asked the patients to decide if they knew which group they were in. And 78% of the sham group and 54% of the treatment group perceived their group correctly. So in effect, it's not very valid. But they are showing that they can't take these techniques on and use them in an experimental design because the patients are not blinded to them adequately. Again, there's a gender difference. 68% of women and 38% of men perceive <laughs> <laughs> their group status correctly. I think at this point we're in the Okay, so I'm just going to buzz through these. I'm looking at the time. Mickey Ardoni, he looked at um, trials looking at the effect of osteopathic manipulative treatment for chronic back pain. Um, there seemed to be no significant benefit when you compare the sham technique and the experimental technique. Um, he also looked at credibility of sham controls. Mayer says that it's not possible to devise a sham control in the case of physical therapies. And I, I must admit, I'm beginning to agree with him. Um, Mercado looked at um, the adequacy of blinding and patient expectation. expectation. And um, the findings showed that the use of imperfect perceived bones is common in low back trials. I won't go into that great detail. It's not a scientific um, website, but I found it very, very useful. Um, this guy's out there looking at the problems with placebo and sham. Um, after I had looked at the experiments that were conducted to examine the sham control, 
I then looked at what studies had been done using Xi'an control. And in the eight weeks prior to the end of July, so that was in the eight weeks prior to my submission, um, two experiments made no reference to inherent problems in devising Xi'an control. Two avoided the issue altogether, um, invalid control or crossover design. Two gave full consideration for the difficulties inherent in placebo design. So of those six trials in that eight weeks, we get a third of them are actually considering that there is a problem with the placebo design. Of the six, oh, I think I've just said that, three ones. <coughs> yeah. The crossover design alone appears to get around the problem. To some extent, the crossover design is not a, um, a randomized control the, it's a within subjects design, and the patient is both the placebo, has the placebo treatment, and the experimental treatment. Am I going backwards? No. Um, oh, good. Thank you. Um, yeah. After I had submitted my dissertation, it was about a year before I was called to present. So when I went to present, I thought, actually, I'll see what's happened since I submitted. So these weren't actually written up in the dissertation. But the first eight weeks of 2011, there were no publications. And in the last six months prior to me um, going to present, there were six publications for osteopathy, and they were six systematic reviews. So there was no original work done. They were just looking at other work. In manual therapy, generally, 11 publications, 10 of which were systematic reviews. There was just one um, randomized control trial. And in the chiropractic, so they are the most prolific, 21 publications, 14 of which were systematic reviews, one pilot study, two comparisons, three randomized controlled trials. So that's what happened. There isn't a lot going on, really, if you look at it. And I've looked at it since then, and nothing's happened. Nothing's happening. Nothing's being published. So where do we go from here? Um, the placebo effect must be considered not just by osteopaths, but by all medical researchers. Um, if you're going to use a placebo control, you must have a walking control. The crossover design together with longitudinal studies, maybe gets around the problem. Although there's a carryover effect. So if you give a person a treatment and then later you give them a placebo, there's a carryover effect from the treatment to the placebo. Um, I think I've got some graphs here so I'll explain that a bit better. Um, so <coughs> more research and a new design needs to be developed. Limitations of the crossover design, which I think is probably one of the best at the moment, Blinding is difficult. Use of placebos with side effects to mimic drugs. So if you were doing it in a drug trial, the actual placebo should have some side effects. So the patient actually is blinded and thinks they're on a drug. Um, <laughs> the above may introduce bias. Um, there's a learning effect. I'm getting a bit worried about the time. Am I all right? There may not be time for no. questions. I think I'm near the end. Yeah. In theory, we've got about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. But we need to enlarge. Yeah. I'm going to skip on, I think. If we look here, this is the balanced crossover design. Ways of getting around it, crossover design. They've got patients with drug, drug, placebo drug, and you can see. Okay, some ways. But obviously, you see, if they have the drug first and then the placebo, there's this risk of carryover. But so you need them to be longitudinal studies. So there's quite a gap between giving them drug or giving them treatment, physical treatment, and then applying the placebo. And some of the things they've done, I mean, I've moved now into what they're doing in the drug industry because nothing's happening with manual therapy. But it's becoming non-ethical, I believe, and it's hard to get through ethics committee when you're telling a patient that they're receiving a medication when in fact you're giving them a placebo. So the drug industry are now looking at coating technology. So they're coating 
the medication and the placebo pill, and it is time release factor in it. So <coughs> the patient doesn't know when they're going to get the effect. Um, so this is trying to do away with the placebo thing and the blinding. And another one is a radio transmitted capsule. So the patient takes the capsule and later on they can trigger its effect when they decide to <laughs> <they're not laughs> <wanting. laughs> Um, so the subject knows, this is to get around ethical issues, knows that he or she will receive a drug but won't know when. <coughs> so what's the message for osteopathy? We have to accept really that it's very problematic. The problem of placebo control is very problematic. And for the manual therapist it's high because the number of variables is so great. So the path ahead, a new direction beckon, an opportunity for new ground opens up. So um, we're looking for that spark, that's something <coughs> exciting, some new approach. It's going to need, as I put here, a flash of brilliance to decide what it is. Um, in the meantime, I thought about Andrew Taylor's still principles. The body is a unit. The body possesses self-regulatory mechanisms. So maybe this is what the placebo is all about. And this is what we um, generate with our hands or facilitate with our hands. Um, and maybe we shouldn't really be, I mean, obviously we've got to produce evidence, but maybe in our treatments we shouldn't really be too worried about the fact that we induce a placebo <coughs> effect. So maybe um, we can harness it. And maybe we are very well placed to harness it. Um, a last little joke there. I don't know, you probably can't read it at the bottom. You may have seen it, I think it was in Osteopathy Today. Now that you're fully recovered, Mr. Dawkins, we can tell you the truth. The 12 hour operation, the intravenous meals, the three weeks of bed rest were all part of an elaborate, elaborate placebo effect. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my bit of poetry. Um, you can read that if you like. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Questions? Um, in my work, I've been looking at um, uh, expectation of pain. Does that come into your remit when, if you go to the dentist, they say this is going to hurt a little bit? It yeah. hurts less than the bit it was before. Well, if, if, the pain, if the doctor or the dentist is going to tell you it's going to hurt, that's a nocebo. Yeah. So you might actually feel the pain more because you've been told to expect that it's going to be painful. Well, the research I've got here says that it shows that the, the, if you were giving a local anaesthetic at a dentist and they say it's going to hurt a little bit, um, then the person believes that it, they accommodate better. Right. I've got some, someone knows But that. I mean, no, there's a lot of evidence that expectation, the, the, oh yes, that's something I was going to add actually. Can I have one more minute? Mm. Because it's something I've been reading over the last couple of days. Um, I wrote it down because I don't think I'd remember it. Mm. Wrong it's along the lines of what you're saying. Um, the late, I've got here the latest thoughts. Um, many placebo effects with different, this is a quote, many placebo effects with different mechanisms in different systems and medical conditions. So there's not just one placebo effect. There are many, and it depends on the mechanism, the system, the medical condition. Um, and they involve, these different mechanisms involve expectation, expectation of reward, so that might be loss of pain, or in the case of a child with a sore knee, a sweet. Um, conditioning, cognitive and social learning. So those things, it's not just expectation, but expectation plays a very big part. Um, mechanisms activated by placebos are the same as those activated by drugs. That was Franzo Benedetti, 2011. Sorry about that. It seems to me that the original definition, the first definition you put up, was written by somebody who was totally autistic. Really? Yes. And, and I didn't the, know that. In that oh, in, you, you, don't, you don't know he's autistic. You see he's autistic. <laughs> no, no, the, the definition is autistic. Oh, yeah. In that it does 
it, it's trying to deny communication. Uh, and it's trying to reduce communication to a chemical reaction. Uh, I, you know, I studied with a professor in the 70s who was trying to bring in systems theory as an alternative view of how to look at living systems as opposed to Newtonian physics. Uh, and so in, within that epistemological paradigm of scientific research, there is no such thing as placebo. Mm. So maybe, you know, I'm sorry you worked really hard at this, <laughs> but, but I, it, to me it's a, it's a, it's a dead, it's, it's, you're trying to put something alive, on, you know, something is dead. Yes, but people are set, you know, they are comparing what they consider to be a non-technique with the technique, and then well, well, claiming I'm saying te te technique, for a technique. Okay, but technique isn't. If I kick a dog, mm -hmm. it's I can measure the impact and how far the dog will go. Mm -hmm. Then what? Is it going to turn around and bite me? Is it going to run off? So it's the kick is part of the communication. But the context is required to be understood to actually know what the response is going to be because it's an intelligent yeah. living system. So, so that whole context is being denied completely or trying to be controlled completely. So I, I find this whole thing about placebo is, is there not another way around it, what I'm asking? Can I well, tell well, a story? Mm -hmm. My dad had a back operation last year. For a long time he'd been looking who can contrast with his two disc prolapses. He didn't trust his daughter. So <laughs> his <laughs> this professor who had this new link into some clinic in Berlin. And the, the operation consisted of two parts. The first one, they go in and repair the disc. But just in case, they also extract some disc material, then roll this in a petri dish. And half a year later, then with the persistence of the back pain, go back and insert the petrodish material in there. So he had the first part of the operation by this very, very well-known, trusted professor. And two days after the operation, he was pain-free. He was absolutely fantastic. Then came the six months later that this well-trusted professor is a member of the same golf club. So <laughs> this is to avoid. And he said, well, Peter, are you, are, you, are you ready for the second part of your operation? And my dad, very scared of operation, said, well, uh, yes, I'll let you know. And he consulted a different friend who did an MRI scan to see what's up. And he said, there's no, no one has been in there. You've got a scar. Nothing has changed. No one has touched that disc. There is no change. And I asked my dad if his back pain was now coming back. <laughs> and, well, he, and he said no, because that would be suggestion of pain. He was brought to theater with people in masks and special lighting and ritually blood -led. Someone produced a scar on his back. I, 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 think, I think Carol's uh, so. cartoon at the end mm, yeah. sums that up. But they've actually done a trial. Yeah. They've done a trial on, on a gallbladder surgery, a clinical trial where they've done a sham operation. And the sham operation has produced the same result as actually taking out, I think it's the gallbladder. Yeah. Okay. There's some recent research, but her reference, which said that if you explain the placebo effect to patients and give them a placebo, a placebo written on the bottle, it still works. Do we have any uh, more questions? All, all I can say is, I think, you know, if you're trying to do research, it's like, well then, how do you, you know, is there any point in doing it? Um, you know, it gets really hard to, when you can't address all these factors, then obviously the research that you're going to do, someone's going to find some sort of objection saying that placebo wasn't sufficiently controlled or whatever. Maybe Anne needs to answer that one, but, um, you know, how do you get yourself out of that 
Well, I think, I think we anymore? have that problem, and I think we, we very slowly recognize and acknowledge the fact in the manual therapies that, that these so-called efficacy trials who deal with placebos and charm treatments are very difficult, if at all possible, to do. And uh, so we are rather going the route of the effectiveness trial. So we are looking at the whole treatment package because ultimately this reflects the real life situation. Again, the patient decides to go to see an osteopath no matter what is involved. So we have all these different factors, you know, and everything together will give the treatment effect. And obviously the nice guidelines on back pain uh, that obviously recommend manual therapies are written in light of these trials that have come out. So, so we, but obviously as a, as a new generation of researchers, we really have to stand up and say, we cannot do efficacy trials because it's so difficult to design placebo controls. So let's go rather the effectiveness route, no matter what Edson um, says, we have to communicate it, we have to write about it, stand up, you know, communicate it in conferences, etc., etc., so that people understand what it's all about and then obviously move forward with the project. And for example, the colleague project is such an effectiveness trial and it will satisfy NHS F uh, research review basically because ultimately it's the decision to go to an osteopath, receive treatment, and then whether it gets better or not, no matter what the active you, you have, Haven't you bounced that through Ernst anyway? We have bounced it through Ernst, and obviously Ernst gave these comments and said you need to find out what the active ingredient is, but in the end of the day, if I declare it as an effectiveness trial, blinding is not up for debate because the definition of an effectiveness trial is that I investigate the whole treatment package. Yeah? <coughs> so we cannot say anything about Thank it. Thank you, Anna. Uh, last question. Did you go ahead? No, I was just going to add that one, when we were looking at the colic trials design, the other group were actually proposing a, a placebo of abdominal effleurage. Mm -hmm. And one of our real reservations about the trial was, well, how can you say that's not going to work? Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's exactly. going to have an effect. Mm -hmm. you, you're putting that up as a placebo. Well, that's mm -hmm. not well, going to work. I think back to what Bruno was saying mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. a nurse applying mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. um, technique to the arm. Mm -hmm. Uh, didn't know what she, that, then they couldn't see any effect, but as soon as the osteopath was in tension, so you know, if it was an osteopath giving um, abdominal effleurage, to it's going to have you know might well have an effect. Um, you know, so you got all these variables. Anyway, I'm going to draw the line under that. Thank you very much, Carol. Yeah.